Um, yeah, just uh, uh, firstly, just I've actually only been here eight years, so I'm hearing people who've been here 30 plus and 40 years, which is, is wonderful. And I just want to sort of give you a brief outline as to why my family, my husband and my young children of 11, 9 and 7 moved to Drysdale. Um, we kind of worked our way from Frankston, Port Melbourne and came out to Geelong. And we chose Drysdale after having rented in Ocean Grove for a year because we loved the ruralness. We, we loved the oldie woldiness Being from England, there's a little bit of that that we wanted to try and achieve as well. And I think that one of the things that is, is very evident that's happening is I feel like some, we're, we're sort of going along a river and we're coming up to the waterfall and it's the, the water is suddenly moving really fast because of this amazing change in the demographic of this area. As we've seen, that there are so many um, developments, so many states popping up. And I think it's, it would be a really good idea. I don't know how to, to do it, but how it could be done quickly, efficiently, with you know, minimal human resources. Because I appreciate you know, the committee, it's, it's volunteers. And, you know, Bellarine Router is so much volunteer work. But I think it would be really valuable to kind of get a sense of all these, what do all these people who are moving into the area what do they want? I mean, are they coming from Melbourne? Do they want this you know, massive infrastructure? Are they looking for, oh, I want to have a petrol station right there so I can get my petrol because I don't want to have to go 10 minutes up the road to get petrol from the station, you know, which is crazy. Mm. <laughs> so if you really, you know, it's like seek first to understand before passing judgment or making decisions, you know, and I think that that's something that I feel is really important. I know we're all here tonight and it's a, a small number of people that are here considering the number we have, so... I'm not a lady of a small number of words, so I apologise if I've rattled a bit, but do you know what I'm saying? I just want yeah, to say it's valuable to get a bit of a handle on what people want. Why are people living here in dry stuff in the springs? What do we want? I'll, I'll, answer, I'll answer, ask you your question. Um. Just listening to, to people talking about the entrance to Drysdale, and I agree with all these statements. Um, I'm from Clifton Springs, I don't know if anyone else is, but the entrance to Clifton Springs, which is from being a resident of 34 years, used to be the fountain. Yes. It's a disgrace. The, the five feature plants have died, <laughs> which is probably... <laughs> oh, they're gone. Which is probably because they're planted in concrete. Um, you know, there's just cylinders sitting there. There's no lighting on it, so at night it's just this dark patch and that lends itself to vandalism. Um, there was no consultation, I believe, from the, the community, you know, when it was refurbished. So, you know, I, I'd like to know from Council, what's their maintenance plan? How, how is it going to be managed? I think at the moment it's relying on a few generous volunteers to, to weed it because a couple of weeks ago it was absolutely disgraceful. It's looking a little better now. But to just think you can put plants in that when there's a concrete base sitting there, I, I don't know how that works with root systems and drainage and so on, but clearly it's not working. Mm -hmm. uh, Gray and I attended a number of meetings re the, uh, our entrance. <laughs> um, we had um, council employees come out and talk. You know, we had some wonderful plans with some lead lighting, lead lighting, lot, lots of great ideas. But then what we got was an utter disgrace. Mm. And there's twenty thousand dollars, I believe, allocated to that. Well, a bit of paint and some plants isn't twenty thousand. As I keep saying to to councillors and council staff, we are the forgotten part of the municipality. And I put letters in the local in the Geelong area to that effect too. Good. I, I, I take the point though that we should find out what the maintenance plan is for that because it's not much sense as you say put the plants and then walk away from them and hope they survive. Um, I, I think we will, we will find out what the maintenance plan is. It's got my point that the shopping centre here haven't had foresight to get a minibus from that train into this town of a Saturday and Sunday. That would be the first thing I'd do if I owned a business in that street there. First thing I'd do is try and find out how to get people off that train into town. Yeah. 
There probably used to be a train line going from here to Geelong, but that's about 100 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I wasn't going to say anything, but I'm hoping to do a community plan to get some transport from the railway station up into town. Yeah. Um, and it won't be on wheels, it'll be a, something else. Well, if it's a courtesy bicycles or tricycles, like you could get a whole family. I don't know how long you have to go once. Oh. bike. <laughs> I just was thinking about the bus from the train station into town. You could actually have courtesy bicycles or courtesy tricycles or quad bicycles. You know, you could get a whole family to cycle into town and they could actually be sort of complimentary if Drysdale put the funding for them there then that would be a way. Because they're kind of active people. The people that get on the train, they're going to have kids and they're kind of a bit interested in a bit of activity. So cycling safely, perhaps down Crimea Street and along the waterholes and in the back entrance of the sort of township would be a fairly safe, quiet way currently to do some, you know, tandem bikes or tri bikes or whatever. Pops up tandem bikes. <laughs> Might be a way to We'll see if we can find someone interested in doing it. Mm. Chris. Um, Sorry, did you do next? We used to actually do bike hire in Drysdale. Yeah, and recently. and the, no one, we got very few hires. Mm. You've got to have someone who's got to maintain it and then someone you actually have them insured mm. for public liability. Mm. Um, and yeah, basically. Yeah, the issue we, of helmets and see if you read anything about it through mm. the so scheme in Melbourne. <laughs> Yeah. So, then, yep. yeah, it's, a lot of barriers in the way. It wasn't wasn't worth the hassle in the end, so we sold the bikes off and stopped doing it. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was thinking of taxis. Do the taxis ever meet the trains? Not that I'm aware of. There is taxis that park there. They, they, they the could yeah. possibly meet the train. There has been taxis parked there. Okay. Okay. Well, some of it could be done as a um, if there was any information, like, you know, it has to have an information board, has to be updated with contact, it could be an Uber um, yeah. a QR code or something oh, like yeah. that on there that people could instantly just get an Uber lift yeah. into town from somebody, or um, I'm actually thinking about setting up a, a um, Carpooling page on Facebook, which is, would not be like Uber because it wouldn't be there wouldn't be any money changing hands, but something like that, you know, going to Drysdale, you know, hook up with a local or something like that, and that could be a way okay. of doing it as well. Again, it looks like it's a communication package we need to put out there somewhere, providing there's enough uh, good stuff for it. Uh, Rick, and then uh, can maybe Liam, Liam, because we've got a captive audience on the train. If you have information on the train for what goes on in drives, mm -hmm. if we had some placards mm -hmm. or even little pamphlets available on the train, they can read them while they're coming to drives or, or at the station at the very least. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so maybe if we the ladies would talk to the train people, yeah. to see what we can come up with. Okay. As I recall, over ten years ago, the uh, Rotary Club had a, uh, an opportunity to, or, or I think was given an opportunity to run their little, their little small gauge drain around Lake Lawn or Point Richards. Now, I'm not sure if they're still doing it, but I think the Point Richards little train set that they had there has finished. Yes. Now, if you had a little train set going around Lake Lawn, I know it would be a little bit of uh, building up because You'd have to put it on high watermark, obviously. But I don't know whether they would, and that, that makes um, Rotary responsible for that little bit as a possible. The issue with the Point Richards runs is the same as what David and Chris are talking about on the old kids. I believe they closed because they didn't have enough oh. engine drivers, didn't have enough people to maintain the thing. And they just couldn't do it. It just, it just fell in a heap. So it is a pity because it was a great little thing for a whole lot of people. We remember that we were coming down there. there, and it was just purely because there was not enough people interested in going down there helping out 
And there's, and there's also public liability insurance requirements and all sorts of yeah. other regulatory re requirements. If you, uh, Diamond Valley in Melbourne is the most successful one uh, and it's been running for a considerable period of time, followed by Box Hill, Sunbury, um, live steamers at Moorabbin, etc. But once again, it is an issue of volunteers. Uh, the bigger ones are quite successful because they seem to attract new people, new blood, but they also generate sufficient revenue to both cover their maintenance and also particularly their public liability insurance. Another option could be the, like the foreshore at, at Geelong, they have a Thomas the Train, don't they, that has, which is just a motor, motorised train with carriages that carry people along the foreshore. That's the way they've sort of solved getting people along the full distance of Eastern Beach. Maybe something like that is a, not quite a courtesy bus, but a bit more than riding your own bike. You do, but it's about the volume and the speed in which you could get into town and from town and shift a few people relatively quickly. What, yes. what about the, the new innovation they have at Queenscliff and Sorrento? Those vehicles that you you oh, hire? Yeah. Okay. The bongos. Okay, Would yeah. they come a few bongos? I don't know. You have to. Uh, I don't know who runs it. Is it council run it? No, no. no it's, it's private. It's a private. It's a. It's a private. Um, it's run through Sea Road Ferries, and I suspect that we'll have an idea by the end of within a 12-month period as to whether that's effective or not. I personally have um, reservations about whether it will survive, um, given the number of people or lack of people that I've seen in some of the vehicles that have been travelling around, but I may be proven wrong, it may be successful. So, that um, may be an opportunity for them to say they're not working in Queenscliff because people get off the ferry for a purpose, or they get, get off from Sorrento to Queenscliff, lunch in the town, walk around, get back on again, whereas the train here to Drysdale, they get here and have no purpose. If you bring those bongo things up here, people get off, get on that, oh, we'll go down through the lakes, um, around the township, even down to the yeah. Dell, you so, might, you and might, they could spend that. You might be able to sell that to them, but you, yeah. you as a community would have to sell that yep. to yeah. them, I suspect. Other than lose them, I mean, if they say it's not viable yeah. in Queenslift, well, perhaps we could put them in, set them up in Drysdale, or get them to set up in Drysdale. I guess we'll find a contact for you. You would know, know someone? We can provide it. Okay, we'll, we'll chase that up because that's vital. I work at the Queenscliff Visitor Information Centre and um, I believe they're privately owned, not to do with the ferry. The, yeah, I know the people, I, I just can't think of their name. I met them the other day. But yeah, we've got their brochures in the okay. centre. So. so if you could get that information to Neil or someone, and yeah, if okay. you could. Yeah, be I'll wonderful. be back there on Saturday, so I'll okay. get it then. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Okay, uh, the next bit we have is annual events, the Glass Festival out, so anything for the potato shed, does anyone have any input or that you'd like to see changes different? Anyone want to come on the Professor of Glass Committee? Okay, um, promotion of our history and local features. Well, we've been sort of through things like that tonight, and I think there's a lot of things that, that aren't here that we, that we could do. Uh, and I didn't put the whole list down because I thought rather than give you uh, something to read off here, it's something that you might have in the back of your mind. Like we talked about Crimea House. Not many people know, even I, don't know too much about Crimea House, and I'd like to. So, and there's possibly stuff out there if I stuck my head up and had a look around, I'd find it. But I think we've got to make it easy and attractive for people to go there and look at it, find out what it did, what it was there for. So I think there's lots of opportunity. That's just one. There must be a whole heap around this place that we could advertise and be uh, part of our history and local features.